Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Thursday night um, look into the Word. And we're so happy that you've been able to come be with us tonight, and we appreciate you joining with us. You know, it's important for us to study and to know the Word of God. And we want to make sure that we are fulfilling the 2 Timothy 2.15 passage of scripture that tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that, that we are to pass the good news of God's word on to those who are around us. And uh, so we're, we're excited about, about doing that, and we appreciate you being with us. I, I also just wanted to say tonight, we all know that um, we have July the 4th coming up. And uh, it is the time in which we celebrate our independence. And we want to just say that I, I, I want to say that I am thankful to be a part of uh, the greatest country on the earth. Um, the freedoms that we have and to be able to worship God, to express ourselves and the things that we have in this country. I want you to know that I praise God for because it's the best country that's in the world. I've had the privilege of traveling to other countries. I've also had the privilege of living in another country for several years. And I just want to say there's no place like the United States of America. And no matter what's going on right now, we celebrate. We want to, we, we thank all those who fight, who serve, who, uh, whether they're our military, whether they're our police officers, whether they are the first responders, the, the fire department, the health professionals, all those that are on the front lines who give their lives to make sure that you and I continue to have these freedoms and they protect us and watch out for us. And we just, we just want to say thank you to all of them. And if it, wasn't for, if it wasn't for those, our forefathers and all those that are here right now standing up for our freedoms, um, you and I would be in a real mess. And I, I want you to know that, that, um, as we go along here, we're going to experience less and less of those freedoms. And uh, we, need to, we need to really be thankful to God that he's given us this much time. And so happy July 4th to everybody that's coming up. And we just uh, uh, give praise to God that um, we're part of this great country. Um, we've been talking about in our Bible study, we've been talking about the doctrine of baptisms, plural. And last week we talked about the purpose of baptism. And, you know, we understand that baptism does not cause repentance. Baptism does not cause remission of sin. Baptism does not cause salvation. But rather, these things cause baptism. Um, it's because of the repentance from my sins and the remission of my sin and salvation that caused me to want to be obedient to the command of God to be baptized. And so baptism happens to us or should happen to us after we have had these things take place in our lives, not before. Um, before all these things, baptism means nothing to us. It's only until these things are done in our lives that baptism is significant. But we want everyone to know that baptism is not just a ritual or some church tradition or to some ordinance. Um, baptism is a part of our salvation. The Bible says in Acts 2.38, repent every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Repent for our sins. Be washed in the blood of Jesus and then be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Because we had repented, he has commanded us to be baptized. We, we talked last night about that, or last week, about that being the purpose of baptism. Um, we saw how in the Old Testament we had shadows of baptism when the Israelites were baptized in the Red Sea, and Noah and his family were um, baptized in the flood. Ark carried them to safety, but the flood was what saved them from that that tormented them or, or, or aggravated them. And so baptism helps us to move forward in our experience with God, in our salvation. We talked about Four prerequisites before baptism can take place. The one is the preaching of the gospel. The gospel has to be preached. We have to hear it. And then after we hear the gospel, the, it tells us that 
believing in the heart the gospel, of the, that gospel that has been preached is important. And then the repentance of the believing one. If I hear the gospel, believe in the gospel, it brings about repentance. And then last but not least, the obedience to the gospel command to be baptized. Those four things must take place in order for us to be baptized. And because of those things, it has saved us from a lot of error uh, when we follow the scripture. You know, and we, as we talk today about the mode of baptism, the method of baptism, and then finish up with the when and who of water baptism, you know, we want to make sure that what we establish ourselves off of is not traditions of men, um, but the scripture. And I know that some of the things I'm going to talk about today is a little controversial, especially in traditional churches and also in the Pentecostal churches. And so we want to we want to make sure, though, that we walk out what the scripture teaches us, not what man says, and and make sure that we are establishing everything that we are and everything that we believe upon the word of God. It's the word of God that we must first be true to, um, not man's traditions, not the doctrines of men, not the doctrines of denominations or organizations, um, but the word of God. And so it's very important. And so we want to talk about the mode of baptism today. Um, when we talk about the mode of baptism, you know, um, this would not be a point of contention in the church if the Greek word bapto or baptize would have been translated in every instance. It means to immerse or dip. Therefore, one must conclude that the mode of baptism is to be immersed or dipped completely in water. And we, we see that Matthew 3 16 says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Jesus would not have had to come up out of the water if he would have just been sprinkled or, or something of that nature, but he had to go down into the water where he was immersed in that water and then coming up out of the water, he saw um, the spirit of God descending. Mark 1, 9 and 10 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn, torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. So when we talk about baptism, we're not talking about, again, we're not talking about a sprinkling. We're not talking about um, any other way except that we would be completely immersed in the water. The next thing we want to talk about is our method of baptism. This is where a lot of controversy takes place and a lot of um, people really get riled when you start talking about the method of baptism. But, you know, we're obligated to speak the scripture. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I'd like for us to remember is um, when, we, when we talk about um, the scripture, um, when we look at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels showed, um, the disciples showed us um, how to do stuff. It showed us how to do stuff. You know, the Gospels were the will uh, of God in our lives. And when we look at the book of Acts, um, the book of Acts shows us how the church carried out the how-tos that Jesus talked to them about. And so when we, when we think about the Gospels, we see the, we see the how, and then we see them in the book of Acts doing what Jesus commanded them to do. Uh, and a lot of the, lot of the controversy um, stems from the charge given in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, Go th therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Um, when we look at that scripture in Matthew 28, 19, he says, go and baptize in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And then the other part of the controversy is Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when he says, Repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, and so when we when we begin to think of that, again, the, the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John shows us the how, and then the book of Acts shows us um, or shows us what to do in the book in the Gospels, and then the book of Acts shows us how they did it. And so therefore the book of Acts would be more informative on methodology since it records the actual complying by the disciples to the gospel command. And when we look at every scriptural reference of obedience to the Great Commission records that they baptized believers in the name of Jesus. Now this is very difficult for us because we don't like the idea of uh, people looking at us in a wrong way. And so when we talk about baptizing people in the name of Jesus, a lot of times people get upset because they think that we're teaching contrary to the Trinity and believing in a oneness type of doctrine. And so we want to make sure that we make it clear that um, we fully believe in the Trinity uh, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that they were all God and make up the Godhead. Um, but we also want to um, recognize the fact that when we look at the book of Acts, that's not how they carried it out. Uh, when they went and carried out what the scripture teaches us, again, we see in Acts 2.38, repent, be baptized, every one of you, how? In the name of the Lord Jesus. But that's not the only scripture, Acts 8.12. But when they believed, Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Also, Acts 8, 14 through 16. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Or he had not yet, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. But they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Acts 10, 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. They asked him to remain some days. Acts 19, 5, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1, 13 says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course, the answer to both those questions is no. Uh, was Paul crucified for you? No, Jesus was. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, you were baptized in the name of Jesus. And so when we begin to look at those things and those passages of scriptures, um, we have to ask ourselves, what about then Matthew 28, 19? Go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But one of the things I think we need to notice is that we were instructed to baptize in the name, singular, not in the names, plural. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, though, even if, even if it was not that, we need to understand also that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not names, but rather titles. For example, if someone comes to my sons and they ask them, what is your father's name? He doesn't, they don't say Father. They, they say Jerry. You know, and so father is a title, not a name. And so when we look at that, it's the name of, not the title. Uh, Colossians, um, in, in Colossians 2, um, 6 through 9 says, Therefore, as you have received Jesus, our Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How do we walk in him? By faith, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one take you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Listen, for in him, for in him, the whole fullness of the deity dwells bottom. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God 
the fog. God wants us to realize that there is no other name under heaven whereby man can be saved. Ephesians 3, 14 through 15 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named. Jesus is the name that is above all names. He, he, we, 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 we need to understand this. We have no problem because the Bible teaches us we pray in Jesus' name. We cast out devils in Jesus' name. We heal the sick in Jesus' name. We raise the dead in Jesus' name. We open blinded eyes in Jesus' name. Why? In just this one arena, one situation here, do we run away from the name of Jesus? Everything that we do in word or in deed, we do it all in the name of Jesus. So why is it? We have to ask ourselves. And here, here's, a, here's something that we have to think about. And I had somebody tell me this one time. I, I asked this question to somebody once and I said, well, then why did the apostles, when they carried out the, the word of God from Jesus' command to go into all the world and baptize, why did they, in every instance that you see in the scripture, why did they not use that same formula? Why did they baptize in the name of Jesus? And he, he, this person actually told me, it was a pastor, this person actually told me it's because they were disobedient. And you know what I told him? I said, well, I guess if that's the case, then I guess they were. But, you know, either, either they were disobedient or yet they really understood more about the command that was given in Matthew 28, 19 than is recorded. I believe, I, I believe from the scripture, they, they understood the absolute importance of the name of Jesus. When we use the name of Jesus, it doesn't take anything away from the Father. It doesn't take anything away from the Holy Spirit. When we move in the name of Jesus, when we preach in the name of Jesus, when we pray in the name of Jesus, it doesn't take anything away from the Father or the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, where the Father is, so also is the Son. Where the Son is, so also, and where the Father and Son is, so also is the Spirit. Why? Because they are one. And so we need to get back to um, knowing that when we are obedient to the word of God, there is power, the Bible teaches us, there's power in the name of Jesus. And because Baptism is not just a tradition of men because baptism is not just some church ordinance or something that we do out of the traditions. Because baptism has such a um, powerful um, work in our lives of, of delivering us from that that aggravated us. That's what, when you look at the word vex, the scripture teaches us that we're separated from that that vexed them. That word vex means to things that have aggravated or things that frustrate or things that um, uh, bother or, or torment. And when we think of when we are, are baptized in water in the command of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of Jesus Christ, and we're baptized, we need to understand that, that God's word, the power of, of, of what's happening there is delivering us from that, those torments. And, and it's such a big part of what takes place in our lives after we have given our hearts and lives to Christ. But yet we need to understand that, that man, there is absolute power in the name of Jesus. We, we, never, we never pray. We never pray. Lord, I bless everyone here in the name of the Father. We, we don't never do that. Why? because we know what the scripture teaches us about the importance of the name of Jesus. And so when we talk about this method here, I know that it is a difficult thing for us to grab a hold of, but yet we need to grab a hold of it and we need to understand that, man, there is power in the name of Jesus. It doesn't take anything away from the Trinity, it doesn't take anything away, and we want to be obedient to the scriptures. And so how do we walk it out? We walk it out in accordance to how we see the disciples walking it out in the book of Acts and on and on. 
So the apostles were not disobedient. They understood what Jesus' command was, and they walked it out, and they fulfilled it. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We never, we never take one passage of Scripture out and teach it as a doctrine or philosophy. We take the whole of what the Scripture teaches us, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so we want to always make sure we do that. And then we want to finish up tonight with the when and the who of water baptism. Another um, somewhat controversial um, aspect of water baptism. When should a new convert be baptized in water? We've noticed, just like other things, we're going to be talking about, um, starting next week, we're going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and how relevant it is even still for us today. And yet, even though it's so relevant, we don't hardly hear any teaching concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit anymore, and we and we definitely don't try to encourage people as much as we used to on receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit after salvation. A lot of people today teach that it's a part of salvation. It just happens at the same time. But yet, I believe that we can show through Scripture that's not the case. And so next week, we'll start on that. And so when we talk about water baptism, I think we've fallen into the same trap. When somebody gives their heart to Jesus, when... Should a new convert or when should somebody who's being baptized in water uh, or get baptized in water? Well, my thought is right away, ASAP, as soon as possible, as soon as you can get them in. Um, no matter what it's got to be, that's what we should do. Because if a person's going to be obedient to the scripture and if a person's going to continue to walk and fulfill their salvation, that is a part of it. As soon as we can begin to explain and explain to them a little bit about baptism, we need to be baptizing them in the water immediately if possible. Immediately if possible. Acts 2.41 says those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Everyone that was converted that day was baptized immediately. And there was added to them, to the church that day, about 3,000 souls. Acts 8.12 Acts 8, um, and also... 37, 38, but Acts 8, 12. I mean, there's a lot more scriptures that we could use in talking about some of this, and especially this right here. But in Acts 8, 12, it says, and when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. When? As they believed. Shows us that they did it right away. But you can also look at, uh, again, Acts 12, or Acts 8, 37, Acts 8, 38, Acts 10, 47, Acts 10, 48, Acts 16, 15, Acts 16, 33, Acts 18, 8, Acts 19, 4, and 5. I mean, the scripture teaches us that as soon as possible, they should be baptized. Why? Because baptism is important to the saving of the soul. Once we get back to teaching that again, we will begin to see more and more people wanting to be baptized when they believe. It's, it's that important. It's that important that we need to make sure that we encourage people right away to be baptized, not letting them go, not letting them drift, not letting them go through things. Now, we understand if somebody does not have an opportunity to be baptized, but I want you to know something. I believe that baptism is so important um, as a part of obedience and a part of the thing of, uh, of, of our salvation you have to begin to wonder if somebody refuses or doesn't want to be baptized, did they really have a change of heart? Has there really been a regeneration? Not that baptism saves us, but yet the emphasis in the scripture is that we would be baptized, and we see it in the book of Acts, that we'd be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus right away. Why would they baptize everybody right away? Why would they do it so often in the scripture right away if it wasn't significant or important? It shouldn't be something that we let go for days, months, or years. But yet we see that happening today. Why? Because we don't look at it as something as significant anymore. But I want you to know I believe it's significant. And I think that it is a testimony, an outward. The Bible says it's an outward expression of a good conscience toward God. But I also believe that it also shows people that we are, we are being obedient 
and we are being buried with Christ, and we are also rising with him in the newness of life. It is a testimony to everybody, but also it helps to separate us, again, from those that torment, that that torments, those things that come after us. It is a, it is a significant aspect of our salvation. And when we don't want to do that, you have to ask yourself, when we do not want to be obedient to Christ, has there really been a change in our lives? If, when somebody comes to the Lord, gives their heart and life to Jesus Christ, but they say, you know what, I, don't want, I don't really don't want to go to church. You have to wonder, why do you not want to be a part of the body of Christ? Why do you not want to fellowship? Why do you not want to do that? Somebody comes to you and says, I really don't have a desire whatsoever to get into the word of God. I I, I, I don't really have a desire to listen to the word of God. You have to ask yourself then, has there really been a conversion? Has there really been a change of heart? You say, well, you're judging people. No, the Bible says that I'm not, I can't judge somebody's intentions, but the Bible says that we know them by their fruit. The fruit is the evidence of what's really taking place. James says, if you say you have faith, but you don't have works, I say to you, your faith is dead. He's saying the same thing I'm saying. If you don't, if you don't want to have obedient, if you don't want to be obedient to Christ, and out of that obedience, if you do not want to do the things that God wants you to do, then what ha then what has to be said then is, wait a minute, if there's not any corresponding works, you have to ask yourself, has there truly been a conversion or is there really faith? Because we already know um, from our teaching in faith here so many weeks ago that not everyone has faith out here. Only those who are true believers have been given the gift of faith and given a measure of faith. And so James says it. If you say you have faith, but you do not have works, your faith is dead. He said, matter of fact, I'll tell you what, I'll show you my faith by my works or by my obedience to the things of Christ. But we're living in such a haphazard life today. We're living in such a lower standard. We're living in such a compromising um, world and church that we want to just throw these things out the window and we just want to try to make it sound like that none of these things are really necessary. But let me tell you something, man. We need to dig in deep and we need to get back to doing what thus saith the word of the Lord. And so a person should be baptized right away as soon as possible, not giving any place to the devil. And then it is because of the desire to be a part of and be obedient to the scripture. The next question we should ask is, who should do the baptizing? Well, first and foremost, we always like to say that the only ones who can, do bat who can baptize are those who have been credentialed. In other words, it should be a licensed minister who has been licensed to baptize. <clears throat> it should be someone who has been given approval to do so. Uh, well, um, to me, that takes away from the teaching of the priesthood of believers, um, first of all, we're all called to minister. We're all called to preach the gospel. We're all called to declare the good news. Now, some of us, um, we have been called into a um, uh, more of a, um, I don't want to say professional um, uh, role, um, but yet we have been called into more of a lead role of uh, governing and, and, and uh, a role of making sure that we help to direct the church but yet all of us, everybody, was given the Great Commission, not just a few. The Great Commission tells us to go into the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That name above all names that represents the Trinity. That name, he tells all of us to go do that. So when we talk about who should baptize, and the answer is anyone who has had that experience themselves can share it. Anyone that has experienced themselves, it themselves can baptize somebody in water. If you're praying with somebody and you're working with somebody and you lead them to the Lord and, and they say, hey, what would stop me right now? Come on, how, what would stop me right now from going out in our backyard here and baptizing me in the pool? You shouldn't say, well, wait a minute, let me call some preacher. Let me make sure I can, hold on, wait a minute, let me, let me make sure I can find a licensed minister. No, you should take them into the backyard, into the pool, and baptize them in accordance to what the Word of God says. We come up with all kinds of silly things that we try to teach that we have no substance for, and we have to be careful. 
you know, it used to be when I first, I can remember when I first um, started going out and ministering, I was holding a revival one time. And after revival, we had quite a few people that gave their hearts to the Lord and they wanted to be baptized. So we were going to go down to the creek and baptize. And I can remember, I was a young man. I, I didn't, um, I guess, know any better. And I came out and I had a, a short sleeve colored um, kind of a dress shirt on. And I was told by the pastor that I could not baptize because I did not have a long sleeve white shirt on. A lot of people don't think you ought to preach the gospel unless you're in the pulpit with a suit and tie on. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of these things. Um, but yet we want to add to the scripture more than what's there. And the Bible teaches us not to add to or not take away from. And we have to be careful that we do that we find ourselves doing that very thing. It's not a matter, don't get me wrong, I think we are dressed decent, be in order. And I, I think somebody that baptized ought to have experienced themselves and ought to know what they're doing. But yet we need to understand that freely we have received and so freely we should give it away. God's called us to make sure that we are obedient to the commands of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine, let's think about this for a minute. Can you imagine how long it would have taken for the apostles to baptize 3,000 people? That's a long time. It's a long time. And so we know that there's got to be something more to it than that that we don't read. And so we want to make sure that we're careful, that we are careful to fulfill the scriptures, but yet understand that to certain extents we are all called to minister. We are all called to do the works of God. We are all called to preach the gospel, declare his good news. We are all called to do the things that the scripture teaches us to do. The Great Commission was not just given to a, a clergy. The Great Commission was given to us all. Visit the sick, pray for the sick, cast out demons, open blinded eyes. Raise the dead. Speak with new tongues. The scripture, the commission was given to all of us. All, not a few. Not a few. And so, and so I hope tonight that you have seen some things in the scripture on the mode of baptism, the method of baptism, and the when and the who of water baptism. And I, I hope that, you know, if, if, if the Lord's touched your heart, hope you'll dig in to the scriptures to find out exactly um, what it is that God has called us to do concerning water baptism. Because I know it will bless you. I know that when we begin to study for ourselves instead of just being um, parents, or what we have to be really careful of as well as for a lot of us that's been around church life for a long time, is a lot of us, we have embedded theology. In other words, really, the only thing that we believe is what's embedded in our heads, not what we study. But everybody should be studying the Scripture, not just reading it. Studying it to know what does God say. That's why discipleship is so important, so that we won't be ignorant of, this word, of His Word. The Bible says we do err not knowing the Scripture. We do err not knowing the scripture. Because we don't know the scripture, a lot of people are going to be deceived. Well, I don't want anybody to be deceived. And I don't want anybody to fall short. I want us all to rise up and to become what God wants us to be. And we have to, the church, the church has to get back to the place where we are no longer ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are no longer ashamed of the good news we are not ashamed of the truth and we're not afraid to tell the truth. We're not afraid to speak the truth in love, to tell people straight up what it is and not shrink back, but to declare the truth of God's word. And that's what God's called us to do. Thank you so much for um, joining us today in the, in the, in the uh, Bible study. And we hope and pray that it's, in, it's been a blessing to you um, let us know. Let us know um, uh, your thoughts and let us know how you feel. If you have any prayer requests, you can put them on and uh, let us know as you make comments. And we will be glad to pray for you. Um, 
But I want to pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray for each and every one that's listening to us tonight. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus, you would just touch their hearts. God, cause them to hunger and thirst after your righteousness. God, you said if we would hunger and thirst and seek your kingdom first, all of these other things would be added to us. So Lord, I just ask in the name of Jesus right now that you would touch each and every heart, each and every life. Lift them up above the shadows. Let the word of God grab them. And Lord, I pray in Jesus' name, if they've not been baptized, God, they will go to their pastor and they will ask them right away, hey, I need to be baptized. If you are saved, if you're a Christian and you don't have somebody to baptize you, get a hold of us and we will fill up our pool and we'll baptize you. Um, just let us know. Father, in Jesus' name, touch them and we give you all the glory and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. God bless you and thank you so much for being with us.